so as Paul said, uh, I'm Vinod Singh. I'm a CTO at uh, Conceris. Um, so I'm going to spend a couple of minutes, not more than that, in terms of uh, introducing you to our company and uh, what we do. And then we'll straight through jump into uh, one of the specific uh, technical challenge that we had. And uh, we'll talk about what was the challenge and you know how we solved it. So more uh, technical thing. Um, so going back to coming to new, so about the Conceras. So we are a, a leading in sales tech uh, a company uh, based out of London. We do have a presence in uh, internationally as well. What we do is uh, we have a, a SaaS based uh, product offering called Quest. And what we do is uh, Quest uh, provides uh, behavioral based uh, risk insight to uh, multiple players into the insurance domain. And that includes the insurance companies itself, the brokers, reinsurance companies, or the like, you know, risk owners themselves. And um, uh, overall, what we do is basically we um, uh, collect a very huge amount of different data that can depict uh, behavior. And then we use that uh, data to then correlate uh, some of the risk events that helps the insurance companies or brokers to really understand the risk at a very detailed level and then they can price it uh, you know better so uh, they should uh, they avoid do overpricing or underpricing the risk so that's the very high level view of what we do um i think uh, the reason i said we are a leading uh, in sure tech because uh, in the market we are really have a very good uh, and a very big names in terms of the customer who trust and use uh, our quest platform on day to day basis in terms of their decision making uh, when they are uh, insuring a new risk or doing a renewals so really pretty uh, uh, good names and uh, we're lucky enough to have all these guys on board um Quickly about me, um, so I'm, as I said, I'm a chief technology officer at Considers. I have been working with the investment banks and some other companies. I have overall roughly 19 years of experience in technology and tech leadership. I don't write code, I would love to. And as you know, um, uh, when you're a kid, you wanna grow up. And when you grow up, you find, okay, what happened? <laughs> so I'm at the same stage where when I was an engineer, I wanted to grow, become a CTO my dream and now i miss me writing code and solving some really coding problem but that's the life um so i i do have a reasonable experience around distributed computing data structure algorithms a bit of that uh, and especially designing high throughput and low latency systems because of my background into uh, you know uh, algorithmic trading and you know uh, all the financial uh, side um I have a bit of exposure to the AI and big data, although I would not claim that I'm a data scientist or a data engineer at any level. I've been more of a backend developer uh, from the beginning. So that's about me. Now, um, let me give you a, a specific business context so that you can understand some of the challenges that we had, and then you will be able to relate some of the technical choices and things that we took or the architectural things that we did to solve the problem. So. As part of what we do, uh, I'm taking one specific uh, uh, variation of Quest, although Quest has uh, like you know, very different market uh, segment in which uh, it provides these insights. I have picked up the marine insurance. So let's say if you want to insure a SIP, um, you know, a big SIP, like oil tankers, bulkers, or you know, so many different kinds of SIPs are there. So I've just picked up that huge case. So what we do as a base data set, we collect um, movement data of all the SIPs around the world. So, uh, and we collect it at a 15 minutes or I mean sometimes five minutes interval. For every single SIP, we have a record of their movement, where they are and what is their speed or where they're heading to and so many other parameters um, every five minutes. And we hold roughly seven years of historical data. So it's a massive like terabyte, billions of billions of records of the movement data that we collect. Uh, because movements gives us uh, useful behavioral insights. And then we also have obviously the master's list of all the SIPs across the world, like where they were built, what is the flag, who operates them, which company holds them, uh, so all those information. Uh, and then there are different kind of zones, so it, like in clustering the entire um, 
let's say uh, all the oceans you know so let's say there is a war zone there is a you know sanctions zone there is a, a high risk sort of a low water zone high water zone high tide zone low tide zone so there are like several different uh, cluster of different zones that we uh, come like you no know, prepare and compute and then there are ports so where these uh, vessels get loaded and unloaded so all all the ports across the world we have that data and then we also collect uh, the historical and current casualty or any incident that may have happened and all the claims that has been made um, you know on these ships uh, through insurers using our customers uh, data on top of it we also have uh, weather data like the historical live and there are so many other data sets that we have and uh, as i said our main job here is to get all these data clean them make them trustable and then uh, find the correlation between uh, you know these data sets and find out the behavior uh, you know of uh, of the ships how it is sailing how it is being operated and then connect that behavior to the risk uh, to see how risky it will be for insurers to insure this uh, based on the likelihood of it getting a crash or it, it going into some doing and something which may cause a cliff so that's sort of a base business case that we have um moving on on top of this um, uh, like base data what we do is we have uh, um, we generate lots of uh, uh, derived uh, we call it data features like you know behavioral insights for example uh, trend around how much uh, what is the mileage uh, what is the area in which the ship is spend more time than less time uh, what is the regular route that it takes from going when it goes from a to b locations and the roughly you know how much time it spends at the port how much time it it is spent uh, while sailing and uh, you know there are like roughly 2000 plus similar sort of a data factors or you know um, uh, behavioral uh, factors that we compute using all the base data that you have seen in my previous slide um and then basically uh, we also compute and uh, calculate and store the correlation between these behavioral factors you know with the risk um so that's sort of you know the kind of data that where we are dealing with and uh, as you can imagine like you no know, like the volume of data is uh, really huge um, terabytes and billions of rows and and um, it's ever growing because the ships are sailing on regular basis so we're getting more and more movement data and we keep coming up with new different features every now and then so so ever growing data set that we have to deal with now the technical challenge uh, like you know in terms of what the technical challenge we have at a considers in terms of uh, providing the value uh, to our customers what we do um this includes basically as i said a like roughly huge amount of uh, geospatial uh, weather uh, iot time series sort of a data set uh, at our uh, uh, in our system and then uh, that we have to answer lots of complex business questions you know across um, uh, this uh, whole uh, uh, on, on top of this data because we do have a risk score and risk uh, you know um, recommendations predictive uh, risk loss and everything else but as you guys can understand the customer would not going to believe whatever we say but let's say we say okay for this ship your risk there is a 90% chance that this is going to have some incident and you may end up being you know, paying a claim they would like to see where we are coming from you know why we think that is going to happen so providing those insights and then they do a uh, lots of benchmarking so for example if they are going to uh, insure uh, a fleet of 200 vessels uh, or ships you know uh, for a client they would like to see let's say if this fleet has 20 oil tankers they would like to do a benchmark data in last let's say in last 5 years uh, in terms of the behavior how these 20 tankers has been behaving as compared to other tankers in the world are they doing are they similar are they very different uh, is that different is more of a positive difference or a negative difference so it's a huge amount of complex business queries that we need to answer on top of this you know massive amount of data set um and then also as you know we are a saas company so uh, whatever we do we can't really throw in a uh, huge amount of hardware on aw we are on aws cloud so we we have to make sure that the cost of providing and answering these business question it should make business sense 
because we are also investor backed company so we need to be efficient and um, it's also uh, uh, com combining these risk factors my last point is it's like it's not only let's say if you find that somebody who di drives at let's say 100 kilometer or 100 mile per hour is risky it's not very easy to say that uh, what is more valuable is saying basically if you drive uh, let's say at 100 kilometer per hour at a, this kind of a road at this point of time in this weather condition, then the risk is high. So combining all these different, uh, you know, behavioral factors together to see which one is depicting the risk based on the historical casualty and claim. So it's all combining mess up and everything else. So that makes it really technically challenging uh, in terms of how do we um, build this whole uh, big data and analytics uh, sort of a platform uh, to to provide this sort of a you know capability to our customer now what all things we tried so our initial thought was because this is an uh, analytics so let's see if we can go with the cube sort of a solution where we build a, a cube and uh, there will be like lots of dimensions and this and that uh, it didn't work because a the data volume was massive and we the number of dimensions and you know things were pretty high and see our data is quite dynamic like whether it's the weather feed or you know the vessel movements or anything else so the cube solution really didn't work uh, pretty well uh, both in terms of scalability and then you know manageability of that then we said okay let's try to adopt microservices with graphql as interface um, so we tried that and uh, what we did is like, you know, our first version of our Insight engine, like, you know, Quest Insight engine was built with a combination of let's use RDS, let's say Postgres, um, and then build the microservices on top of it, uh, uh, have a GraphQL based API and deliver it. And uh, one thing that we did really uh, good is like spending lots of time around GraphQL schema because we knew that Postgres is a very short term thing and we have to maybe move to and try something else. But we wanted to do that with a very limited change. So making sure our contracts remain same. So we spent and, uh, uh, you know, defined a GraphQL schema, which doesn't really care about underlying technology. Of course, our data access layer will change, but rest of the application and business logic can remain the same. And then we, uh, we hit the scalability challenge, uh, I think within like, I think a year or something, then we said, okay, let's try uh, Presto S3 and MongoDB combination. So some of our data, especially on the transactional and IOT side, a streaming side gets stored into MongoDB. And then um, we have some of the data that is coming from our data scientists and data engineers coming into S3. And um, so we, what we use, we use the Presto DB, um, uh, to combine these S3 and MongoDB together and, and, and basically hook up our GraphQL servers to, to basically, um, uh, you know, uh, use this pressure to, to, to generate and, you know, deliver those insights. It is still in production and working fine, but we are about to hit another threshold bottleneck. So we have started trying uh, Snowflake, more of a multi, like massive parallel processing sort of a, uh, you know, arena. Uh, so the, these uh, MPP uh, warehouses, so Snowflake, Google Big Query, AWS Redshift, we did a POC. Um, I think all of these things uh, brought in some pros and cons, but um, we decided to go with Redshift because um, uh, Redshift, A, we are already on AWS, and B, Redshift is more of a you know SQL-based interface, which works pretty good because Presto was also a SQL uh, RDS was so the change, like you know, the cost of changing that thing would be minimal. So we are um, we are into a kind of a beta in terms of our uh, you know putting into the production, but this is where we are heading, and um, and this is what we did. So what we did is like we broke entire business questions into these sort of a five uh, you know at, uh, different uh, um, aspects. So context. Uh, which is basically what do you want to know about? Do you want to know about a SIP? Do you want to know about a, a policy? Do you want to know about a zone? Do you want to know about a port? What exactly is your center of your question? And then there is a dimension like, okay, uh, like it's like, what is your, uh, what are the different uh, attributes at which you want to group your, you know, uh, data into? 
and then uh, and then like an attributes like okay while you're asking for this thing you may want to uh, have more information about these insights so enriching those insights and aggregation that you're doing and then actual actual measures and facts um and then of course the filter so as you can see lots of these terminologies are very close to the olap world because they also have a dimension facts and things and things like that we sort of stole a bit of that uh, terminology because it used to work pretty well and then we designed our uh, graph ql schema into this like we using this concept uh, that i'm talking about uh, you know and at the center so our apis our contract um and we also have a way to basically in terms of microservices we can have a different microservice uh, uh, addressing to different context so it also gives us that granularity and scalability we can scale without building a single monolith sort of insight engine so uh, it has been working pretty good and as you can see on the um, on, on the right hand side the, the the diagram so it's a very high level logical sort of an architecture um so we have a data science big data platform where all the data cleansing feature extractions correlations and predictive insights sort of a, uh, you know things happens and then um, all those uh, uh, computed data set then uh, is, is put through s3 bucket and then we have a set of lambda functions and step functions uh, to make sure it does it gets you know through a data pipeline to get into the our analytics environment and then on, on the below we have this um, our main app through which people are creating new zones uh i know we are collecting the live vessel movement data and there are some alerts and notification happenings and then you know war zone sanction zones all these transaction aspects new policies are being added claims are being added and all of these will change the risk insights uh, of you know of, of the risk so collect combining these two uh, together through presto uh, and then we have like you know having that uh, these uh, the quest uh, uh, you know microservices uh, uh, sitting behind the api gateway uh, providing the graph uh, uh, you know things to to deliver that thing so that's the overall i know it's a very short things i tried to make it crisp and you know very like you know short and summary but i hope you have got a pretty good idea around you know sort of a technology and uh, you know the technical challenge the graphql approach the schema approach Athena or Journey and all the way through Redshift. So Presto in this picture, Presto will be replaced by uh, Redshift, and then our pipeline will push all the data into our Redshift data warehouse, and then our uh, microservices will point to that Redshift cluster to deliver those insights. That's all from my end. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Vinod. I it was super interesting presentation. I, I have one question that uh, you know, like always, um, uh, kind of like comes to mind when we're talking about you know companies who are trying to solve really difficult problems and they're trying to solve like, really difficult technical question, questions. And uh, you know, in your case, you've mentioned I really appreciated like how you iterated your approach on the early stage and like you know you now over hundred people uh, company you're still trying to get to do things better. So how do you kind of like balance the act between having a stable solution for all the clients you have, all the people who trust your system versus trying new things to, to keep doing it better? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And I wouldn't say it's very easy. I would be lying if I say that's easy because we have a live customer. Uh, but what we do is, as I said, we spend lots of time around that contractual you know uh, richness of our apis or our contracts or services so in this case you have seen that although we have been changing the underlying database underlying sort of technology bit but all of other system that we have like you no know, the most of the business layer and everything remains same so that right level of abstraction so i would not take this credit i would give that credit to my engineers because that's what they're doing so like really putting a nice sort of abstractions and then uh, peeling away things and injecting in, and, and that basically gives us agility. So rather than having a big, massive six month project, you really do in agile using that abstraction and very rich contractual APIs and you know, contracts within the services. Uh, 